It is Tips from the Top for episode 917 for September the 14th, 2022. Tips from the top, from the top floor, tips from the top, all right, from the top floor. Hey, hello and welcome back to Tips from the Top Floor. We are in for some interesting stuff on this one let me let me start off with a link to a little video animation um that one i titled have the smartphones won well if you look at that little graph here in your browser it's uh it, it shows the development from like the sales numbers of cameras from 1951 starting with the kodak brownie which is like in the under a million, and then uh, it goes on till 19, let's say, 70, uh, somewhere in the end of the 60s, the Hasselblad 500C is like 5 million, and then the SX-70 uh, Polaroid creeps up there, Pentax K-1000 is still sub-10 million cameras. We have Fujifilm Quick Snap disposable camera, that one gets 20 million sold. And then we end up with the Nikon F100, which just bursts that whole bubble uh, upwards, and then the Digital Rebel, and now the smartphones come on on the on the on the graph here. Uh, 2007. Well, the iPhone starts the whole thing, and we are looking at 1.5 billion of smartphones sold. So if you count smartphones as cameras which they <laughs> surely are then yeah the smartphones have won pretty much long ago it's amazing if you see those numbers in comparison um also gives you an idea how many um, people used to have cameras compared to how many people have cameras now and yes i know the 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 uh, the owners of smartphones are not necessarily all photographers but they do have a really capable tool in their pocket and uh, that's yeah the smartphones have one <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that <laughs> especially in numbers um i'm not talking about the let's say the the, uh, the the image quality and so on there's still stuff that a smartphone can't do that a bigger camera can do but on the other hand there's so many things a smartphone can do that a bigger camera uh, definitely can't do. I spent uh, last Sunday on a photo walk in uh, Kassel in the city here in Germany with a few other people and I decided to only go smartphone and it was very relaxing. Also street style photography with a smartphone. Yeah, no one's gonna look at you and and tell you not to take that photo because it's only a smartphone that you have in your pocket. So yeah, interesting Interesting numbers here. Um, second topic. I uh, f Three months ago, I did uh, an interview with Meredith Rawls. She is a, an astronomer at the Veracy Rubin Observatory. And uh, she's also very tightly linked to the research and the, uh, let's say, the whole um, scientific, astronomic uh, dealing with the light pollution coming from from satellite constellations. We're talking about quite a few being up there in the sky right now. We're talking lower Earth orbit, some 500 kilometers in height. And uh, astronomy and astrophotography, of course, um, have for a few years now been complaining about, I think especially Starlink, because uh, Starlink is the biggest constellation out there. Um, and uh, th three months ago, we talked about um, that. And we, I just released an updated video that I'll link in the show notes. Um, because I talked to her again after there was an official, uh, what was that? An official conference kind of thing that dealt with these uh, satellite streaks, which is what they call them in these pictures um, taken by the telescopes, you will see those reflections of the sun in parts of the satellites as bright streaks. So question, first question, of course, is what does astronomy do? Um, they are employing stacking 
as do the ast astrophotographers, which is a technique where you take lots of pictures and then mathematically uh, mathematically add them up to each other, which helps uh, keep the noise low, which helps um, average out things over time. Um, and then you can, of course, I, th I think I think you see this in astrophotography, like if you don't want a plane that flew through the night sky on there, you just take those pictures out where the plane was on, or you edit those pictures and take the plane out. And um, they are, the, the astronomers uh, are doing similar things. Um, other projects, of course, uh, go are around software. We're talking streak detection. So automate the process of... Uh, understanding which of the different pictures have streaks, and then uh, you have a you have a you have a semi-automated way to deal with those. Um, one other way they tried over the summer was uh, what they call satellite dodging, which is the the telescope just moving out of the way. Oh, there's a satellite. They know when the satellites will be where, at least well close enough. The the satellite operators provide that data, and uh, yeah, they. Um, <coughs> excuse me they um tried that but turns out that was too expensive in terms of like uh, set, uh, uh, in terms of telescope time so they ended up not moving the telescope to the side for each of the satellites but instead uh, deal more with the with the streaks they also founded an official organization that the cps which stands for the center for the protection of the dark and quiet sky from satellite constellation interference uh, cps.iau.org um, is a website that uh, is not just more of a well uh, I think it's more of a lobbying effort but also they they collect a lot of data they are trying to make sure the problem is well understood and um, that they have that they have information in case they need it so that is the side of the astronomy but then of course there's the satellite operators and the big, big elephant in the room is Starlink, SpaceX Starlink, because uh, they are the ones that have, like, I don't even know, almost 3,000 satellites up there right now. And uh, they are by far the biggest constellation. Um, but then there's others as well. And there are other constellations that are either already up there or that are planned to be up there. Uh, right now, um, the CPS website lists a few interesting numbers. Uh, right now, we're talking five constellations up there. Um, in operation, 2,800 satellites. There are 3,700 that have been launched. But after launch, they will take a time to go into their operational orbit. So um, that's the situation right now. But then there are in total 16 constellations in planning a lot of them are on telecommunications and uh, in total based on fcc and itu license applications are you sitting down 431,713 satellites are planned whoa that's almost half a million of satellites um I doubt they will all be up there at the same time. The, the satellites have a, well, the Starlink satellites have a, um, a life of like, a th I think a lifespan of about five years. So they are going to um, have satellites deorbiting while others are going up. And again, that's not just Starlink. That is the 16 constellations by uh, 16 different operators, I guess. But the question is, what do the satellite operators do to help mitigate the light that comes from the satellite the reflections it's it's it's, it's pretty much reflections from the satellites the sun uh, especially near what's called the terminator which is uh, there's nothing to do with arnold schwarzenegger it's the line where day and night um, connect that's the terminator and the satellites over the terminator are well, you have the the dark sky, the satellite is up there, but it's still high up, high enough up to be hit by the sun, and then you have bright parts of the satellite um, shining light down. You have reflective parts of the satellite, pieces of the surface, the solar panels, and so on that can actually reflect light straight down, and uh, that's that's the kind of light pollution we're talking about, and uh, that that conference that happened recently 
um, the, the, had one presenter, which was Starlink. Someone from Starlink um, presented what they have done over the last few months in terms of engineering and in terms of helping to mitigate uh, their, their the brightness levels of their satellite. And uh, it turns out that Starlink is about one of the only ones right now that is actively doing something. At least that's my understanding. And uh, what I picked out from their publications is that they have um, done quite a lot. Uh, they have, first of all, they have what they call a dielectric film, a so-called Bragg reflector, B-R-A-G-G -G reflector. You can, there's a, there's a Wikipedia entry for that. Um, and what that does is it's, it's like a like a mirror, like a mirror foil that you put on the satellite that has very specific reflective uh, properties, and that uh, foil will allow the satellite to bounce light off and uh, and sort of miss the Earth. Right? If you keep the satellite at a specific angle, then the sun uh, will hit the satellite. But if you if you're doing a good job at at positioning it or at, at rotating it then that light will never come back to Earth. It will be um, reflected somewhere into space. That film is uh, it's an interesting kind of thing. It's like thousands of layers of something. And then, it's of course, it has to be space-stable. It has to be uh, working for the time that the satellite is going to be out there. And, and uh, it's also radio transmissive, so they can put it over their antennas without any problems there so that is that is one thing um they have a second thing they call terminator tracking which is a maneuver that the satellites will do we're talking by the way starlink version 2 not the existing ones that are up there but the second version that will pretty much replace the first version uh once it once they go up there um, so Terminator tracking is a maneuver where um, when the satellite is near the Terminator, it will move into what they call a knife edge configuration, which means it'll rotate so that it's... These satellites look like oversized pizza boxes. They're very, very flat. So what the satellite can do is it can rotate so that the, that the, um, the bulk of the surface is not pointing towards the sun, just the side the very thin side is pointing to the sun, and this way the the whole uh, area is is not gonna be um, reflecting much. So that's the second maneuver, and uh, they are planning to do this despite it during that maneuver taking about twenty five percent of their performance out. But um, well, they said they won't do this. And the third is they have a they've developed a really black color, which it's not Vanta black, but it's I think near Vanta black. Uh, of course, it has to be space stable again. It has to uh, survive uh, five years or, or more up up in space, um, which is a harsh environment for not just for the temperatures, but for the harsh UV ra radiation. But yeah, they will paint like stuff that isn't covered by that film. Um, it's my understanding that they will paint a lot of the rest of the satellite uh, in black, and this way. Um, absorb the light. They did try something like that earlier with the version 1 satellites, but it turned out that it accumulated too much heat. Um, so for the version 2, they have also um, uh, deployed some changes in the satellite to be able to cope with that additional heat. Um, and also they are going to offer that uh, that reflective film to other satellite operators for at cost. So well, what are the others doing? Um, not much, as far as I uh, as I know. Um, Starlink is the first one. They also have the biggest constellation, so um, I guess they they have they have to do something because otherwise that's a that's a PR issue. <laughs> and uh, they are well, they're doing that. I'm not sure the other satellite operators will take them up on the foil at cost because if you look at some of the satellites that are going up there um blue walker 3 for example <laughs> those antennas are so big we're talking uh i don't even know how what square footage that is but it's huge um, there's photo out there photos out there look for blue walker one word and the number three and you will see their big phased area antennas are like massive and i'm not sure they can actually just put reflective fall over them um, also it turns out that 
this is something new I learned. Satellite operators um, don't always build their own satellites. Uh, Starlink is a, is a bit of a special case here because they build their own satellites. They have their own rockets. Um, and a lot of the others um, outsource the satellite building and uh, outsource the, the rockets, the rocket part, getting them up into orbit. So um, the question is, are they willing to change, to redesign stuff for that? Uh, dielectric film foil reflective thing anyway so yeah and what doesn't help with the with the light problem is well the, the the growth of the constellations we are looking at a new a new business a new type of business out there that has emerged over the last few weeks at least into my uh into my uh, knowledge and that is satellite to mobile communications direct uh, so we're talking your smartphone, the one that you're carrying around with you in your pocket, uh, will be able to talk to satellites for emergency purposes. We're not talking watching YouTube uh, out in the wilderness this way, but it's a technical feat to build a satellite with an antenna that is big enough to be able to to bridge those 500 kilometers between the satellite and the mobile. Normally, those base stations, those uh, cell towers, are just a few miles away. So now we're talking, I don't even know, 300-something miles. Um, that's, yeah, Apple has just recently announced their new uh, satellite, direct satellite communications. They are partnering with Global Star and uh, the uh, T-Mobile USA has uh, just partnered with uh, Starlink to do the same thing um, sometime next year. And then, yeah, um, AST, Blue Walker 3, that's a test deployment right now. Their business model is exactly that, satellite to mobile and just satellite to mobile. So they are, they are going to have to work with big antennas out there, with big phased arrays to make this possible. So the problem is still there. And if you want to find out um, what the astronom astronomical community thinks about that, check out the link in the show notes about astrophotography and Starlink. All right. Next up is a video tip. Um, do you remember Lytro? Lytro is the... Well, light field camera that, uh, I don't even know when Lytro came out. The first Lytro camera, when, and the big claim to fame was the photos that you could refocus after the fact. So you could take a picture and then decide where the focus is afterwards. That was a few years ago, and uh, they made quite a big splash. Um, I played with one of these uh, Lytro 1 cameras, the one that looked almost like a lipstick kind of uh, form factor, just a bit bigger. Uh, I played with one, uh, turned out, yeah, no, it's not that interesting. Didn't give me too much advantage over what I do right now, especially it lacked in the, in the, f in the area of resolution and the area of how to present those pictures to the public. You had to have them hosted on their server and so on. It was a bit of a weird kind of setup but um, it was it was the first kind of uh, camera in that in that direction and and uh, that was followed by the Lightroom 2 which was more resolution bigger more professional um, but th it didn't really work out as a let's say as a consumer commercial uh, success that part did not really play out and then they pivoted into the professional field they actually ended up with um, with a with a with a cinema camera um, presenting that, just just trying to think when was that 2019, 18, 17, sometime around that, uh, which was a 40k resolution cinema camera with intense frame rates and refocus uh, refocusing and. Uh, they promised things like you could just shoot stuff in the in the parking lot and then remove the background and swap it out for. I don't know, Tatooine or something like that, um, which with the light field uh, technology is possible. Um, but it was, the camera was so advanced that, and, and so technically difficult that they didn't even sell it. They just rented it out. And uh, even that was not cheap. So um, that whole thing <clears throat> ended up not really working out. And then I believe uh, Lytra was, bought up by Google. So the talent, I think, is still working on these kind of things. 
Um, yeah, Lytros history, that's a very good video. It's like 12, 13 minutes long and highly recommend you watch it if you're interested in this uh, fairly recent part of uh, photography history. I'm pretty sure we will see these things reemerge in one way or another. I'm not even sure if maybe the the portrait mode and things that you see in some mobiles is maybe might even be a direct result of these kind of efforts. Um, at least the algorithms behind these things. Uh, it looks very familiar. All right. Next up, space again. And this is I, this I found interesting. Um, we have talked here uh, about exoplanet detection and James Webb, the James Webb Space Telescope is has one one part of its mission is to find exoplanets, which are planets that rotate around other suns and of course preferably ones that are similar to the Earth. And uh, we talked about the methods. There are, there are different methods. Um, for example, if uh, if one of these exoplanets, you can't normally see them like directly. You can't just point a, a long telephoto telescope on there and say, "Oh, look, that's it's moving." Uh, no, what you would do is you would uh, image of a star over time repeatedly, and then if the planet moves in front of the star, it results in a minute reduction in brightness, and that minute reduction. Uh, the, the James Webb Telescope is good enough to detect that so you can extrapolate. You can also look at the composition of the spectrum because a planet will, well, not just shade it, but the planet, if it has an atmosphere, will um, have some of that star's light go through that atmosphere. So the the entire spectral composition will change ever so slightly and uh, James Webb is good enough to detect that. So that's the, another way to to look at what is on those planets. And then there's other the wobble method. I talked about this here, where if, if the if the orbit is um, if you're looking at the orbit and it's it, the, the planet rotating around the star will move the star slightly. So you'd see that star have a have a, a repeating pattern of motion side by side and uh, you could detect that with a really good instrument and then there's the other wobble that comes towards you and goes away from you which will change uh, will red and blue shift the spectrum of the star just ever so slightly again detectable but yeah the direct imaging part that's the part that i found hard to believe because these stars are really far away and now it takes it turns out that uh james webb has just done just that it has just taken the, a direct image of a distant planet for the first time um and i find this really cool i mean you you kind of understand how hard it is even for like if, if you have a telescope in your in your backyard you might see saturn which is part of our solar system but then go further out and it becomes even harder and harder and harder now what we're looking at at this here is uh different galaxies stuff that is so far away and still uh james webb is good enough to do a direct imaging of that now i'm i'm not sure how i mean the pictures look it looked like a little blob but um so we were not looking at high detail level of the surface we can't see if there's any aliens on there but um direct imaging of a exoplanet for the first time i thought that was worth cheering for that is pretty pretty cool all right and last but not least happy birthday magnum magnum the photo agency yeah that's they've been around for 75 years now and uh they are just um celebrating their birthday and i just recently looked into the history of magnum because yeah magnum everyone has heard of magnum um but um when did magnum come together so here's a little tiny little uh look at the history magnum was founded 1947 by robert caper Henri Cartier-Bresson, David Seymour, and George Roger. And they did that in New York. And uh, the reason why they wanted to have their own agency was because they wanted more rights 
they want to have a better grasp on the rights or on their pictures because um, especially at that time a lot of photo magazines and other agencies um, came up and uh, the photographer at that time was more more of a let's say a helper for the writing people and uh, the f photojournalism was just being established and then back there there was a lot of war photography um the time life came out out in the 30s so that had been like a few years old at that time and they needed all these magazines needed a lot of pictures especially from areas from from war areas and these kind of things because that is always people people are interested in these kind of things so um, that together with with more technical developments in smaller cameras, the Leica, for example, 35 millimeter format, um, that changed a lot of uh, things for photography. The material, the film became uh, more sensitive, so that made them a lot more flexible. And yeah, this is how Magnum came to be. The name is apparently or. The legend says the name came from when they when they had their their when they founded the Magnum Agency. There was a Magnum bottle of champagne involved, so um, that is apparently the the namesake for the company. And uh, yeah, they they tried to be independent. That's a that was an effort in independence. Also, they they formulated rules uh, on how their pictures could be used which is kind of akin to copyright we have that uh, here in germany in a well in a, in a different form but also something along those lines where you have to um have to legally have to unless other specified uh name the photographer when you publish their photos it was also about uh, the magazines couldn't crop the pictures unless otherwise said so. And uh, the rights on the picture would stay with uh, the photographer or the rights on the negatives would stay with the photographer, which gave them more opportunities to um, to market their, photo their photography. So New York was the start. And then later on, they added uh, another office in Paris and the members of the agency... Uh, sort of like split up the world uh, among each other. K Kappa and Seymour were uh, were in charge of Europe, and uh, Roger went to Africa, and Katya Prasad and his wife from from uh, Java, Ratna Mohini is her name. Um, they took Asia as their main focus, and. Yeah, so that's how that's how it started. They over t over the years had um, unfortunately uh, the amount of women was always more on the low side. The same thing we see right now with uh, f with photography in general. It's still a very male dominated field, which um, I think definitely has to change. Um, but then over over the years, uh, the sale of the sales of pictures to magazines didn't really uh, wasn't wasn't enough financially to keep this thing afloat. So they added books, they added postcards, they added vintage prints. We have a few Magnum uh, prints here in in our in the viewfinder villa because because um, from the original negatives because that's just awesome <laughs> um <clears throat> so yeah 2010 magnum uh, sold their archive of about 185,000 photos to the company ms capital lp and uh, they cataloged it and uh, made it available to the public online that was 2010 and then uh, 2020 that that whole catalog was taken offline again uh, after one Magnum photographer, David Allen Harvey, got uh, into trouble because of, the, of a photo series that they published um, about Bangkok prostitutes from the 1980s. And uh, this was connected with, uh, with um, sexual abuse in some way, underage sexual abuse. So um, that 
catalog I don't think is any is online anymore. There was a lot, a lot of uh, trying to find out if there was more of that. So there was a bit of an ethical debate there for for sure, and uh, and of course it should be. Um, yeah, and that is kind of the history of Magnum. There we have a couple of books here about Magnum. Magnum contact sheets. I can still highly recommend that. Um, they have. It's a good look behind the scenes, a look behind the look at the contact sheets of some of the famous photographs out there. And it's really, really eye opening to see um, what kind of photos the photographers took around the famous photos, how the selection process went and so on. So um, that would be my recommendation. And again, happy birthday, Magnum. You've been around for a long time. And that was it for this episode of Tips from the Top Pro. Thank you so much for being here, for listening, for being subscribed, and all the things that you can do. And of course, you can leave a feedback for the show at tfttf.com slash hi. That's tfttf.com slash hi. And that includes you writing something or recording a voicemail and attaching it. I love to hear your voice. Um, yeah, tfttf.com slash hi. And Alex from Boston, Massachusetts, has done exactly that. He writes, Your discussion about X-ray scanning at the airport. Had a scanner operator friend in a major international U.S. airport once tell me that they would slip training images into the live stream to make sure the operators were paying attention and for training purposes. They may not always be looking at what you think they are, it would seem, perhaps. Great show as always. Welcome back to TFTTF. Yeah, Alex, you are right. Maybe they didn't look at the, an air quotes, trigger in my, in my backpack. Maybe they were looking at something that they were fed for training purposes, even though I would think if that's a training exercise, then their, their boss would be nearby to, to help them out. So as they were all alone and didn't know what to do with the weird contraption in my backpack, I, yeah, but hey, who knows? I don't know. I've never really watched these these monitors. Anyway, that was it. If you want to leave your own feedback, tfttf.com slash hi is where you do that. Of course, follow Tips from the Top on Twitter at tfttf photo, tfttf p h o t o. And if you can, please support the show at Patreon, tfttf.com slash Patreon, tfttf.com slash Patreon. Your support really makes a difference. It starts at $1 an episode, and I'm eternally grateful to all of you who can do that and who do that. Thank you so much. And now go out and take amazing photos. Be really nice to each other. Promise me that. And of course, happy shooting. Happy shooting.